Well, hello and welcome again to our devotions at Christ Baptist Church. As we're just taking the time each and every day to have a, some type of a devotion and reflection on uh, just how we can learn to read the Bible as well as just how we can understand our God as well while we're in this time of, uh, of a lockdown and, and tightening. But, but it's also a good thing that we can do just to get our habits of, of how to go through the Bible with our families. And so well, we've gone through numerous books of the Bible with Daniel and First and Second Thessalonians and Jonah as well as some other topics that have helped us. And now we want to start the book of Esther. And uh, Esther is just, it's, it's a great story to read. It's a great story for the family to understand. And I'm hoping to provide some insights uh, that will help us to understand this is, this is a story that actually created one of the, the great festivals in Jewish history that is practiced even today came right out of this story. So there's a festival they do once a year, every year in, in Israel, because of what happened historically here in the book of Esther. And uh, I think there's a, a, a good follow-on since we've gone through the book of Daniel uh, to go through Esther because Esther happens just a few years after Daniel. And, and it might be good if we think about it, just as we've looked at Daniel, we look at Esther, we might want to look then at Ezra, and Nehemiah, and even the books of Malachi. All of those happen like one right after the other uh, of what happened after the Babylonian captivity, uh, which happened about 586 BC. And so uh, from 600 or so is when Daniel got taken captive, and then 586 is when uh, Jerusalem was taken, the Babylonians ruled Israel and the Medes and the Persians then took over from Babylon and they continued to dominate the region and dominate Israel. And so we went through Daniel. You've got that. You can take a look at the book of Daniel and even go back over some of the devotions to, to see what we learned from that. But now we've got the book of Esther. And the book of Esther has some interesting aspects as we get into it. One of the aspects of Esther is the name of God is not even mentioned in the entire book. The, the, the name of God, Yahweh, is not there, so you'll never see the words the Lord in your translation. It's not there. It's like he's silent in the entire book. So you think God's not doing anything here. This is a great book that teaches us a very important principle. And, it, and it's a principle called providence. Providence is uh, a Latin word. It's where we get the word pro video, to see beforehand. Providence. It means God is directing things to happen to move to a certain place in history according to his purpose. So in essence, it's God having already determined the future moves all the pieces in history so that we will arrive exactly at that point in time in the future. And so this is God dealing with his people, Israel, showing us that he's not even mentioned, people don't pray to him, and yet he is moving all the pieces together. So it's what we call, the, the, the book of Esther would be called behind the scenes. It's what God is doing behind the scenes. Well, we can just get into it, chapter 1. All chapter 1 is doing is just setting the context for us, is setting the stage for a behind-the-scenes event, which, by the way, when we get to it, I'll let you know when we get there, there's a place where it's an exceedingly stressful time for Israel and a time of history where Israel was more on the verge of being wiped out than she was in World War II. It's a place of, of unimagined fear that would have taken place here in the book of Esther and how God intervened in that. And it's actually as a result of a sin that happened hundreds and hundreds of years beforehand. Just willful disobedience by an Israelite king actually comes into play here in the book of Esther. We're going to see that when it comes as God is moving all the pieces around to make this happen. So let's just get into it and understand what's going on. It's just a very interesting 
case here in Esther chapter 1. I'll, I'll read some verses and I'll just explain others as we go. Verse 1, Now it took place in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. In those days, as King Ahasuerus sat on the thro royal throne, which was at the citadel in Susa. So, what's happening here is, it's, it's like saying, now I want to tell you, it now began to happen. It took place. Something took place. It took place. There's an event we're going to learn about, a big event that took place. And it took place in the days of a king named Ahasuerus. That'd be the Hebrew more name for him, but it, in Greek what we would call him is Xerxes. Not Artaxerxes, but Xerxes, the one who came before Artaxerxes. Xerxes was a king who had a very impressive father, Darius I, who really had amassed a great amount of wealth, and when he died, he, Xerxes inherited, gave himself the name Xerxes, conqueror of men. And, and he fancied himself as a great warrior. And uh, soon after this time in Esther, he decided to go after the Greeks. And that's when he began to lose part of the Persian Empire. Is he was decided to go after the Greeks, and the Greeks actually uh, just, they outsmarted him and defeated his armies. And that began the downfall. But Xerxes reigned for about 20 years, 485 to 465 right before Artaxerxes came, who was the one who reigned under Nehemiah. And so these how the, this is how the Persian kings go and, and under the, the various characters in Jewish history. Now it took place in the days of this king Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, and it's the one who reigned, notice here in your verse first here, from India to Ethiopia. Can you imagine that? His kingdom went from India all the way past where Iran is, all the way to North Africa and Ethiopia. That's the extent of where his rule was. In the 20th century, there was always a common saying, the sun never set on the British Empire, because the British had her empire around the world, so the sun never set, because at some place the British Empire, was, the sun was shining. Well, that's what this is trying to say. Out of all the world, out of known, the known world, Xerxes had the greatest, single biggest amount of power and land, more than the emperors in China. It's been recorded. And so this wants, this, the authors want to tell us, in the days of Assyrius, in the days of Xerxes, when he reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces, he sat on his royal throne, which is at the citadel of Susa, which is about 200 kilometers north of the, uh, the Persian Gulf. In the third year of his reign, that puts us about 482, 483, in the third year of his reign, after being in, in there three years, he gave a banquet for all his princes and attendants, the army officers of Persia, media, the nobles and princes of his province, being in his presence. So, in the third year of his reign, he considers himself to be very prosperous, very successful. What the writer wants us to know is that this king is impressive. He essentially ruled all of Asia Minor, the Middle East, anywhere. He reigned everywhere. He had all the power. Israel had no power. Israel were all slaves. It's like game over for Israel. There's no chance they'll ever come back at all. God must have sold them out, sold them down the river. Because here's this king, this great king, 127 provinces ruling, and then he's going to have this huge banquet to show off his amazing wealth. So, we see that, verse 4, he displayed the riches of his royal glory, the splendor of his great majesty, for many days, 180 days. That's half a year. For six months, he said, I'm going to display my wealth, parades, banquets, all of this, and he's, he's just going to town with making sure everybody understands how great he is for 180 days. Now, the next verse says, when those days are completed, he's not done yet. He gave another banquet now, lasting seven days, for all the people who were there in the citadel at Susa, 
for the greatest of the least, he wants everybody in his city to be able to come and, again, have a banquet with him and say how great he is. So verse 6 tells us that there were all these hangings of linen and, and, and purple linen and silver and marble and all this was all there, like set up for parade, kind of like when World Cup was here. And we had World Cup signs everywhere. That's what it was like here in the Citadel of Susa. And then in verses 7 and 8, drinks were served in golden vessels. So you didn't just drink, you drank out of golden goblets. I'm not saying we've got more wealth than we know what to do with. And there's more royal wine available. You can get it all at a discount. Drinking was done according to the law. There was no compulsion. You could drink. There were no laws against drinking as much as you wanted. And so he said, you can drink and drink and drink. It's interesting he put that verse in there in verse 8 to say something specific about drinking, isn't it? Just, just a verse in there to say, the king is so prosperous, everything's so great, but yet he wants to get it so that everybody can drink according to what they want. And it said so that according to the orders to each official of each household, you can do according to the desires of each person. Anybody does what they want. You can't tell somebody what to do. Now in at the same time, the writer's telling us in verse 9, Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the palace, which belonged to King Assyrius. So she's got her own, his wife's got her own banquet. Two banquets going on after this. Okay, so that we see that happening. She's introduced here. You see, God is behind the scenes working, and he now has us understand who the wife is. So on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, that means stinking drunk is what that means. It means when he was completely inebriated. He, he was not thinking clearly because he just set up the stage with verses 7 and 8 about how much people could drink. So on the seventh day when he was really sauced, he commanded now seven men there are seven men he listed here. And it's interesting that he is these seven men, and they're called the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Assyrius. He sent seven men who served in his presence, named them to bring Queen Vashti before the king with the royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the princess, for she was beautiful. Now, there's nothing in the history records anywhere that says what this was about, why he summoned her, and, and, and what's going on. Everything's a guess as to what's really happening. But there's no doubt he was drunk, because that's what the Bible tells us. And, and so he sent seven strong men who served in his presence by name. These are his personal attendants. He didn't just say, send a message to her. He, said, he, he actually sent a message to her along with the message that he was sending to her. <laughs> and the message he sent to her is, you know what? I rule this place and that I rule you. That was the message he sent to her. And the message they had was, the king says for you to come. And he wanted to do it because the statement right there in verse 11, for she was beautiful. She was stunning. It was a beauty contest. Best in the whole kingdom. That's, that's what Xerxes, he could, he could not tolerate anything less. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times. Check that phrase. You might want to underline that in your Bible. It's found only in a few places in the Bible. Men who understood the times. Boy, that's, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Men who knew what was going on. Men who understood the politics. Men who understood this was the third year of his reign, and we've had a six-month banquet here, six-month party, six-month festival. Men who understood this king is really full of himself here. And they understood the times, for it was the custom of the king, so to speak, before all who knew law and justice. So he, the king wasn't just rambling out there. The king was now very angry because, verse 12 tells us, the king became very angry and his wrath burned within him because Queen Vashti said, I'm not coming. I'm not coming. 
We've actually said, these seven men, no, you can go pound sand. I don't, I don't do that. Look at you. You're a mess. Well, the king knew enough to talk to men who knew the, understood the times. They were all lawyers. And these men were close to him. And he names all these here. They're called the seven princes of Persian media who had access to the king's presence. And they sat down in the first place in the kingdom. And the king wanted to know, according to law, what can I do? What can the king do to his wife? I mean, it's the queen. What is to be done with Queen Bashi? Because she didn't, she didn't obey the commands that I gave, delivered by these seven men. I mean, come on. Notice in verse 16, a man named Memukan, who was one of the seven princes, it says, in the presence of the king and the princess. So he, he didn't say, let's talk about this in your office. He didn't say, let's go to the boardroom. In the presence of the king and the princes. Here comes this brilliant guy who's playing up to the king. He understood the times. Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also all the princes and all the peoples who were in all the provinces of King Isaac. He, he made the crime bigger than it is. She's actually insulted everybody who's got a wife. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands by saying, King Isarius, at Xerxes, commanded Queen Bash to be brought in his presence, but she didn't come. See, that message is going to get out. This is the feminist movement coming right here. No, I'm not, I'm not listening to you at all. And, you know, to her defense, you know, and her husband was stinking drunk and, and said, come here and parade yourself in front of all these people. You know, she said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm your prized possession. Well, he was still in a fit of rage. And uh, this Mamukan was talking. He said, this day, the ladies of Persian media who have heard of the queen's conduct will speak in the same way to all the king's princes. And notice these words here. And there will be plenty of contempt and anger, for sure. King, you want your whole kingdom to be in an uproar? You're going to have every family split apart. Every wife's going to have contempt and anger because of what Vashti's done. So here's our advice, verse 19. To please the king, you make a royal edict. Let it be written in the laws of the kings of Persian media so it can't be repealed, just like in Daniel in the lion's den. Exactly like Daniel in the lion's den. Make a law, put the stamp, and it can't be repealed. So Vashti may no longer come into the presence of King Asarius and let the king give her royal position to another who is more worthy than he. In other words, get a new wife. Didn't even divorce the person. Get a new wife. They obviously weren't going through the idea of marriage and the biblical idea of marriage. It was just someone that the king chose to say, you're going to be with me. And so I want to give us another one who's more worthy. They obviously define worth as whether you submit to the king or not. And so when the king's edict, which he will make, is heard throughout the kingdom, great as it is, that all women will give honor to their husbands, great and small. They'll tremble. You see, nobody, we don't put up with this. Here's a way to advance our strength in the kingdom. No, no doubt, maybe these seven kings had problems at home, problems with their wives. That is a way to fix that problem. Thank you, Vashti. You just caused us to be able to, be able to set up a law that I can, I can clean up my own house. So verse 21, this word pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Mamukan proposed. And so the king did this, and he made the document, and he signed it, Verse 22, he sent letters to all the king's provinces. 127 provinces had to get this letter. 127. The party was in, in Susa. But here comes the 127 letters going out to all the king's provinces. To each province, according to its script, and to every people, according to their language, so it was even transcribed into other languages, that every man should be the master of his own house and the one who speaks in the language of his own people. That's the end of chapter 1. Just a simple event, but it's setting the stage. Because, see, God is behind the scenes, and we're going to see this as we move on. Because what has been happening? Israel was invaded 586 B.C., about a hundred years earlier. A hundred years earlier, here comes Babylon, and they come into Jerusalem, burn it to the ground. And they take people captive back to Babylon for 70 years. 
under the influence of Cyrus the Great, the first Persian king in the kingdom of the Beads of the Persians, he is, is moved by God through Daniel and the lion's den to send all the Jews back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, which they do. Now this is about 536 B.C., 535 B.C., that he does this. So, for about 40 years, 50 years, essentially, the Jews go back and they start trying to build a temple. They can't go back and forth and there's opposition. Meanwhile, Cyrus the Great dies. Other Persian kings come in. And there's a king, Darius I. And he rises up to prominence. And they start building the temple again in this way, but, but they stopped under Xerxes. So under Xerxes, we read in the book of Ezra that they, they had stopped under these kings. So now Israel's kind of frozen. They can't be in Jerusalem. They can't be anywhere. And they're spread all over these 127 provinces. So Israel is no longer in Israel. They're spread all over the place. And here's this king, Xerxes, now, in 485, he takes the throne. He's an arrogant man. He, he wants to stand up over all the other people. He wants to see himself as a mighty warrior. And here in chapter 1, what we see is a building up of who he is, and that in, in his time, he's got 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia, going all the way past Iran, up north. And he is so pleased with himself that he has a 180-day festival, a banquet at the end of it. His wife holds another banquet. Drinking is prominent. They're all not making sense. He calls his wife in in kind of a humiliating way. She refuses, and so he just says, okay, fine, you're out. You're the most beautiful in the province. You're the most beautiful, actually, in all my kingdom. But I don't care, you, you didn't do what I said, so you're out. And his, his advisor said she needs to go, and she's, she's going to go. What does that do? That leaves a hole. It leaves a vacuum. It leaves an emptiness for a queen, doesn't it? Now there's no queen. That's going to lead us to chapter 2, the beauty contest. How do we find the queen? And who's it going to be? God is operating behind the scenes while his people are anxiously waiting, wondering if they're going to be exterminated because they're spread all over the place. The, they have no hope of getting back to Israel. There's a little bit that went back to Israel, but these people like Esther and her cousin are all over. They're in, they're in the city of Sue. They're in, Iran, in, in modern day Iran, essentially. So there they are. And where's the hope that we'll ever be back with our people again? and we can worship our God. There seems to be no hope. The sun doesn't set on Xerxes' empire. That's what we see. But in God's providence, through a simple act of drinking and anger, and he fired his wife because his counselors told him that's a good idea, now we're stuck in a situation where Xerxes needs to have his number one queen, and there's an opening. What are we going to do? Meanwhile, Israel is essentially having no hope, no future at all. That's the picture that we have in Esther chapter 1, coming right on the heels of Daniel, who said, everybody go back, which they did. And now we get a picture of what the Persian Empire looks like. It's like Israel really doesn't have a chance to, to grow and, and come back again. And we're going to see how close Israel came to extinction. So follow along here. The book of Esther, the first chapter, is God setting the stage here as he is operating behind the scenes. A lot of detail. That's why we like the Old Testament. A lot of detail telling us about the king and his wealth and his armies and all these things that are happening. Very important to get the picture of, of how much man sees so much prominence coming out of, of predictability 
we certainly know in the last couple of months how unpredictable things can be as God operates behind the scenes. So this is chapter 1 of the book of Esther. We'll see you tomorrow as we go to Esther chapter 2.